Hello folks! In this video, I'll be explaining the remarkable new proof of the Pythagorean Theorem, which has been making waves since it was announced in the spring of 2023. It's noteworthy not only because it was discovered by two high school students, but also because it's based entirely on trigonometry rather than geometry, which was once thought to be impossible. I'll present my interpretation of the proof based on information I found online, since it hasn't actually been published yet. Links are in the description to articles about the authors of this proof and how they became mathematical celebrities overnight when news got out about what they had done. Although this isn't the first trigonometric proof of the Pythagorean theorem, it is perhaps the most innovative and straightforward. That said, it's a bit of a wild ride, so buckle up and let's check it out. First, I'll label the two acute angles of the triangle alpha and beta. Then, reflect the triangle around one of its legs to create an isosceles triangle whose apex angle is 2 alpha and whose base has length 2a. Next, I'll draw a line which splits this triangle into two right triangles and call its length h. What we want here is to get an expression for the sine of 2 alpha. And the sine of an angle in a right triangle is the length of the opposite leg divided by the length of the hypotenuse. So here that would be h over c. Similarly, the sine of beta is h over 2a. And going back to the original triangle, we see that the sine of beta is also b over c. Okay, now if we multiply both sides of this sine beta equation by 2a, and then divide by c, we can see that the sine of 2 alpha equals 2ab over c squared. How cool is that? Note that we could have gotten here in fewer steps using the law of sines, but I wanted to be absolutely clear that the law of sines doesn't have any dependency on what we're trying to prove. Okay, now we're going to consider two separate cases. The first case is where a equals b, which means alpha and beta are also equal. And since the angles in any triangle add up to 180 degrees, alpha and beta must add up to 90 degrees. So in this case, they're both 45 degree angles. That makes 2 alpha a 90 degree angle, and the sine of a 90 degree angle is 1. So, if 2ab over c squared is 1, then 2ab equals c squared. And 2ab is ab plus ab. And ab is both a squared and b squared, since a and b are the same thing. So, that's qed for this simple case. For the rest of the proof, we'll look at the case where a does not equal b, and without loss of generality, we'll choose a to be the shorter of the two legs. For this case, the strategy is to construct another right triangle which has 2 alpha as one of its acute angles. To do that, I'll draw a line perpendicular to the original triangle's hypotenuse, and then extend the reflected triangle's hypotenuse until it meets that line. With this new right triangle, we can again measure the sine of 2 alpha. This time, it equals this leg, which I'll call x, divided by the hypotenuse, which I'll call y. So, x over y is equal to 2ab over c squared. And now, we'll compute x over y a different way, by measuring the lengths of those two lines. So, how can we do that? <laughs> of course, my instinct would be to simply put this all into a coordinate system, come up with equations for the lines that make up x and y, use those equations to come up with the coordinates where these lines intersect, then use the coordinates of the other endpoints of x and y to compute their lengths using the distance formula. But, uh, uh we can't do that because the distance formula is nothing other than the Pythagorean theorem, which is what we're trying to prove. So that method is out of the question. And this is where the proof gets really clever. Let's split this new right triangle by drawing a line perpendicular to the base of the original triangle. Then 
add another line perpendicular to that one. And then again, and again, and again, ad infinitum, creating a tiling of this big triangle with an infinite number of smaller and smaller right triangles, and thereby partitioning x and y into an infinite number of segments, each of which is the hypotenuse of one of these inner triangles. Now, notice that each of these triangles is similar to the original triangle, meaning that all three angles are the same, and thus the side lengths are proportional. Check it out. The right angle of the outer right triangle is split into two angles, one of which is beta, and so the other must be alpha, since we know they add up to 90 degrees. And that means the other acute angle of this inner right triangle must be beta. For the second inner triangle, the angle at the top must be alpha, because then we have all three angles of the original triangle combining to make a straight line, which is a 180 degree angle. And again, that means the other angle has to be beta. Now, notice that the shorter leg of the first triangle is the same line as the longer leg of the second triangle, which means that the ratio between the dimensions of these two triangles is A over B. So the hypotenuse of the second triangle, Y1, is A over B times the hypotenuse of the first triangle, X1. Moving on to the third triangle, the exact same reasoning tells us that this is also a similar triangle. And again, the shorter leg of the second triangle is the same line as the longer leg of the third. So again, the ratio between them is A over B. And that means the ratio between the first and third triangles is a squared over b squared, since we've applied the ratio a over b twice. So x2 is a squared over b squared times x1. And so it goes on down the entire sequence of diminishing triangles. For all the same reasons, each successive triangle is a over b times the previous one, and each consecutive segment along x and y is a squared over b squared times the previous one. That means that if we call that ratio r, we can rewrite the lengths of all the x segments in terms of x1 and r like this. And the length of x is the infinite sum of all these measurements. Now, we know that this sum converges to a finite value because, well, we can see it in the picture, or you might already know that this kind of sum, which is called a geometric series, converges to a finite value if the absolute value of the ratio r is less than 1, which it is, since a is less than b. There's a well-known formula for the value of a geometric series, which can be derived by multiplying both sides by r and subtracting the result from the original equation. The left-hand side becomes x minus rx, and the right-hand side, well, if you slide each term to the right, you can see that everything cancels, except x1. Factor out the x on the left-hand side, divide both sides by 1 minus r, and there's the closed form for a geometric series. Of course, y is going to be similar, except that it has an additional segment of length c at one end. Now, what we're interested in is x over y, so let's first combine the two terms of the y expression into one fraction, and then divide x by y. The common denominators cancel. Now we need to figure out what x1 and y1 are. Recall that y1 is a over b times x1, but what is x1? Well, that first inner triangle's longer leg is 2a, and since it's the longer leg, it's analogous to the B leg in the original triangle. So the ratio of that first inner triangle to the original triangle is 2A over B. X1 is the hypotenuse, which is analogous to the length C in the original triangle. So X1 must be 2A over B multiplied by C. That makes Y1 2A squared C over B squared. And there you have it. From here, we can let the animation bring it home.